and our final talk today is given by the group leader of Quantic Group, Sorin Paranu. He is testing me with his long title. I cannot remember it. I need to look it. It was. Oh, perhaps sorry, you <laughs> you will read it yourself. Yeah, please, Let me ask you first. This is the 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 group. The group name is Quanti. I like it. It's the uh, only proper Finnish group title. Is there a story behind it? Well, it sounds good. <laughs> yeah, it sounds good. I agree. Well, that's it. That's the story. Yeah. So can you? Uh, I can. I can try. Vivere pericolosamente in the quantum Excellent. world. It sounds so like a James yes. Bond movie. Yes. Uh, yes. Driving at the quantum speed limit and taking shortcuts to adiapticity. Thanks, Nick. That's excellent. Um, okay, so thank you also for uh, organizing this and for having us all here. It's so nice environment here. Are you all enjoying it? Are you all enjoying it? Yes. All right, good, good. Let's go to the real business now. Uh, so what I'm going to say are a few things about what happens in, uh, in uh, my group um, related to the topic of uh, quantum simulation. And that what I want to say is that we are at a very interesting situation nowadays in uh, um, quantum technologies that we have devices, a few devices which are imperfect, but they work as imperfect as they are. So the question is, what can we do with them? Something interesting and something nice. So let me thank for this work to uh, people who have contributed to this particular topic of uh, uh, STIRAP and SAS-STIRAP, which I will introduce shortly. So uh, Antti and Sergey, and then there will be posters by Shruti and Mika in the uh, poster presentation today. And so, yeah, I will say a few things about what happens when you drive a system in general slowly and then when you try to do it a bit faster. And uh, how do we uh, make this kind of shortcuts to adiabaticity or what we call su superadiabatic uh, uh, transitions. So the topic of uh, quantum simulation, yeah, we have one of these uh, luminaries of uh, simulation, which is Seth Lloyd. He's shown here near, he's a brilliant theorist, right? Everybody knows this. Uh, he's shown here in a near a dilution fridge, uh, which is dangerous for a theorist. I wouldn't allow this in a lab, a theorist of this caliber to come close to my dilution. No way, absolutely no way, yeah? So he says that exactly what I tried to tell you before is that we have these imperfect devices, and of course it would be nice to have a um, universal quantum computer to make these gates perfectly and so on and so on. But the question is, what do we do with what we have already in the lab? So he has, if life does you quantum lemons, let's make quantum lemonade. And this went to nature. And so the story of, um, um, of the field goes very way back in um, around 19... Uh, 23, when Charles Babbage, a British uh, mathematician, got a grant from the British government to build an engine that calculates, that makes tables for astronomy. This was useful. Tables were expensive at those times, so a machine that would make them would have been very nice. So he got 1,700 pounds at the time for nine years. Okay, and he was supposed to produce a machine. We have eight years already in the center of excellence. Yucca, we have eight years. Babbage got nine years. And <laughs> so by the time of these eight years, we have to produce something like that, yeah? So she actually did produce something quite uh, not very functional, not, but he did show uh, something for the money. And he got some kind of uh, even uh, an extension of the grant for 10 more years, after which the government decided that enough is enough. It's not going to work. We have to cut this guy down from our budget and so on. So the grant was cut and, he, and that was it. Until in the 90s, uh, some uh, enthusiasts from the, this is from the British Sci London Science Museum, um, 
they, they got the idea that let's rebuild this kind of uh, machine, which is called the differential engine or an analytical engine and see if it works. And it does work indeed, it's quite nice. So I believe that we are not uh, very much different from the situation in uh, those long time ago uh, with uh, our simulators and quantum computers where actually you, you see we're operating machines of this size in the lab that pretty much do things in a um, non-digital way so they are not really gears and uh, uh, wheels that rotate there and so on but our qubits, yeah, they do rotate on the block sphere. So we are kind of like there. Okay, so what we do actually in the lab? So we have these kind of chips that we uh, evaporate and we design them ourselves. We go to the clean room. We have transmons here. We have resonators, coplanar waveguide. All these things are superconductor. We have Josephson junctions. And we want to control this experimentally from the external world, from our devices, which are in our um, at room temperature, we want to control them using electronic circuits. And we want to do something useful, like computing something or simulating some kind of system. How do we make these things? Well, these things are not really atomic scales. They are not really macroscopic, so they are in this intermediate scale. They are at the mesoscale. So we have these machines in the clean room that precisely are designed and uh, to, to do this type of fabrication. Uh, which we control here. There are our postdocs and PhD students who are brave enough to understand how this whole machinery works. And then we are able to draw to do nanolithography at the scales of the order of tens of nanometers. Yeah, that's what we need for this type of um, device. And then we do have this type of samples where you see here the transmon and the resonators and these lines that are used to address the the qubit from the uh, external world, we put them, we assemble them and we put them in a sample box and we bone them and then we mount them in the dilution fridge at around 10 millikelvin and there we hope that we can measure them, they become superconductor and we do something interesting, yeah? And then from the outside world it looks like this, there is Sergei here who is controlling all these instruments and so on. And this is what you are all familiar with, Mo many of you are familiar with from, from our labs, yeah? So it's a question of programming these instruments, basically programming your chip to do what you want to do, yeah? Okay, I'm gonna uh, tell you then what we have been actually doing lately. So one experiment is related to what is technically known as, as STIRAP. It's uh, called Stimulated Raman Adiabatic Passage. And we're going to explain what, what it is about and how it works in a very easy way to understand. So as I it was uh, said here many times before, these are artificial atoms. Yeah? Since they are artificial atoms, they have level systems. Uh, they have energy levels. So I in the case of the transmon, you have uh, energy zero, energy one, energy two, and so on, up to whatever, some level, pretty much like in the case of natural atoms. So let's look at three of these guys, and let's imagine that they are in what in optics called the lambda configuration, because that's easier to understand. So now my task is, how can I transfer population from the ground state, from the zero state, to the state two, yeah? So this will be my task. Initially, I'm in the ground state, like you will be now when you jump in the lake, in the frozen lake outside here. You, yeah, you cool down the system, you are in the ground state. And then the, the, the goal is to transfer this uh, population to the uh, state number two. So how would you do it normally? Well, you put a pi pulse from zero to one, and you transfer everything from here to here. Maybe you wait some time or maybe you don't, but then you put another pulse from state one to two and you transfer everything there, yeah? So this is a sequential order of pulses in which you, in the end, do are able to transfer from state zero to state two. Now in quantum physics, there is another way of doing it, which is very interesting. It's called a counterintuitive sequence. So it works like this. You start in the ground state and then you put some Coupling, so you address this, you drive the transitions between state one and state two with this guy there, yeah? And then you couple the transition between state zero and one. And then you turn off this one here and you just keep this for some time. 
and at the end of the sequence you end up in the state 2. It's a bit magic, right? Because in the beginning you are here, you see you are here, and you are doing something up there with these two states, while in the end you are here, you no, you end up here, and you are doing something I with these two states. And the pulse sequence looks like this. I imagine that these are some Gaussian functions. Yeah, so it's it's quite uh, it's quite an uh, interesting thing. Um, how it works in uh, reality, it's uh, in the experiment. Uh, so these are experimental data. These are the pulse sequences that we are using. These are traces from the measurement. But you see that what happens here, the population of state 2, which is in red here, increases, 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 while the population of state 1 decreases, decreases, decreases. Yeah, so this is the uh, uh, process called stir up. Now imagine the following thing that you would do this in space. And imagine, for instance, the following situation, that you want to travel from Helsinki to New York via London. So you have two flights, Helsinki to London and London to New York, yeah? How would you do that? Well, you go first to the first flight and then next to the next flight, right? And you end up in New York. Now, if you do it by steer up, what you will do is you wait in Helsinki, nice, relaxed. Your flight takes off from London, it goes over the Atlantic, and then it lands in New York sometime, and you board the flight in, uh, in Helsinki, and you are still flying on the flight in Helsinki, and somehow magically at the end of this whole thing, you end up being in New York. And this, by the way, it's important to say this, without spending any time in London, in the airport. The population of state one here is zero all the time in this process. So that's really magic. So you are transferring from here to here, apparently by going through this state, but actually if you measure the population of o on the state one here, it is zero. So you are not spending any time in London. You are not changing gates. You are not going through check-ins and nothing, right? So, so um, yeah, you can see that uh, also in the experiment, the population of state one, which is this green one, remains zero during the the run of uh, this experiment. Yeah, so we uh, managed to do this experiment. This is the pulse sequence, and this is the density matrix that you would get for the qubit at some point during the run of this uh, uh, stir-up experiment. All right. So next thing I want to tell you something about SAS stir-up, which is the super adiabatic or shortcut adiabaticity version of this stir-up. But let me say what are the restrictions in the case of stir-up. This is a slow process. It has good parts. The good part is that it's extremely robust against uh, defacings and imperfections of the pulses. But it's slow. In order to make sure that you are following what people call uh, dark state, yeah, um, this has to be done very slowly. And so um, it's subjected to the adiabatic theorem, which is a theorem you remember for quantum physics uh, that we all learn. It's discovered, it has been uh, proven in uh, 1928 uh, by uh, Fock and uh, Born. And uh, that's it. So we are slow with steer up. But can we do things faster? So SAS steer up is a way of doing these things faster, and it works like this. We have a three level system here with these three states. And then there is a control pulse that we are uh, adding, which really cancels the non-adiabatic excitations on state one that you would get by driving the system extremely fast, yeah? So this is a two photon pulse, in fact. It's a transition that couples directly zero and two that we add, and this is designed precisely to cancel this non-adiabatic effect. It's a very, very specific mathematical shape. Now, interesting enough, um, this leads to the following structure. If you look, um, if you see, imagine that these states are in uh, space and these are some sites where particles can jump from here to here, it's, it's very much analogous to the Aharonov bomb effect. There is a gauge invariant phase with that we call phi here that appears here, and this is the sum of this external phases of the pulses, of the three pulses that we put here in, uh, in uh, our system. 
So we have a demonstration also on the effect of gauge invariance in the system. And this obviously simulates what uh, you would expect to have in a, a system that has uh, in a lattice, for instance. Um, in the experiment, we see this very nicely. So we have the stirrup experiment that you would see here. For instance, this line here with P2 reaching some kind of fidelity of up to 0 0.8 something. But then when we put the SAS stirrup, which is the fast advanced version, uh, high fidelity of the stirrup, yeah, we have managed to reach a much higher fidelity above 0 0.9 here in this short time. So this works very nicely and exactly as predicted by the theory. It also is a way to study the quantum speed limit. So the quantum speed limit is a limit which tells you how fast you can change a state into one another, into another state. And its uh, quantum speed limit is subjected by the laws of quantum physics and it's quite a very well un known and understood concept. And in this case, what you see here our steer up ex is the stirrup experiment on this side and the SAS stirrup experiment on this side and this on the right side are theoretical simulations. So what you see here is that the time that it takes here for the stirrup, which is in nanoseconds, so we have like 55 nanoseconds here to run the stirrup, um, is uh, very much shortened in the case of the SAS stirrup, so we get down to 15 nanoseconds to in, in this region of the parameter space. And this is about a factor of two larger than the quantum speed limit. So we are approaching the maximum limit allowed by the laws of qu quantum physics, which is this uh, quantum speed limit. Now, this is how things look in the lab. Yeah, so we are operating the dilution fridge and we are programming the devices that are there and thinking about how to really do the physics and the experiment. And I was uh, starting to tell you about simulation and uh, yeah, if you want to get more technical, we can surely get much more into understanding how this thing works. But you see, it's this whole story that I told you about is analogous to uh, uh, three sites in a spin chain. It's uh, mathematically exactly the same structure. And there's a lot of uh, correspondence between what we call the simulator, okay? and the spin chain. So we have, for instance, in the simulator, lambda s and lambda a coupling, which is our Gelman matrices. And uh, here in the spin, if you have uh, known, if you know this uh, spin physics, it's XX interaction and jalozinski mori interaction. We have chirality, or we have quantum Fourier transform in the simulator, and uh, we have uh, very nice correspondence between currents that develop in this spin chain and the operators that you can define in this three-level system. So it's a nice example in which you have a very simple system, yeah, and you can do very uh, physics which relates to another system that you don't have access to. Um, what you can also do is to look at what happens in the in a representation which is called Majorana stellar representation. This is also called Majorana sphere. And you see that in this representation due to Majorana, yeah, you know that Majorana is famous for many things. Maybe I've uh, heard of Majorana particle. This is yet another thing that he has done. And uh, what is shown here is that how the, the, the roots of uh, a polynomial equation that he has invented develop over this sphere. And this is the magnetization, effective magnetization. And you can see that we start in this state, which is the bottom of the Majorana sphere, and we end up by the SAS up exactly at this upper point, which is what uh, corresponds to the state number two. Um, let me just tell you how, just like a, a reminder of uh, what we have shown here and what we have presented, what is the difference between SAS up and up? So in the case of stirrup, imagine that I have this cup of uh, water, it's water here, yeah? um, and I want to transport it from one place to another. So I would do it very slowly, nothing happens, yeah, from one place to another if I move it like this. And that's a, an adiabatic process. If I want to do this process non-adiabatically, this thing happens, yeah? So the water will spill all over. But SAS up is like you have the ability 
to control the system by using an additional Hamiltonian, which is like doing this type of thing. Yeah? So you are really keeping the water there by using your skill uh, and uh, an additional level of degree of control over your experiment. So this is pretty much what I was planning to tell you. And uh, what you see here is uh, an image of our dilution refrigerator. Of course, we are proud to have the qubits all the time in a superposition of state 0 and 1. And uh, let's see what happens when you put more and more qubits and you couple them and what kind of experiments we can continue to do. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I would like to ask about that Majorana representation. In your movie, it started slowly and then it accelerated. Yeah. What is the explanation? Yes, of because we start from minus infinity. Yeah. So it's the tail of these Gaussians that actually ideally goes to minus infinity. Of course, you have to start from one point, but it's just a question of when do you decide that it's your time, zero time, where you start to start the movie. Yeah, so in the beginning, in the remote past at minus infinity, nothing happens for a long time until you start to see these Gaussians and then something happens. Yeah. Yes. Can you say something more about this counter adiabatic pulses, how they refer to how yes. they are? Yeah. Yeah, so these counter adiabatic pulses in the experiment, we have, uh, uh, they are realized by a two photon pulse. So there are two photons that are uh, absorbed at the same time in the system. And the interesting thing about what we can do with them is that we can create a coupling which is complex. So in order to have this counter adiabatic term, actually the coupling has to be of the form I omega zero two. So there has to be a complex number i instead of the usual Rabi thing. Your Rabi frequency in this sense has to be a, a complex number. Uh, not only that, but there has to be an exact relation between the amplitude, this Rabi omega zero two, and the omegas and the theta. Uh, okay, I'm getting in technical details, but uh, the omegas corresponding to the other two pulses. So the amplitude of the counter diabatic pulse has to follow in a very specific way the mixing angle which relates to the dark state in the stir up experiment With the relation is that omega zero two is two times theta dot where theta is the mixing angle angle in the stir up so yeah it has to be fortunately we have nice waveform generators it has to be very precisely uh, realized in this way Okay, let's thank Sorin again. Okay.